Hello everybody, my name is Mahmoud Hussein. I'm a PhD student at Helmholtz Center Berlin for Energy and Materials and the University of Potsdam in Germany. So today I'm going to talk about new solvents for stable tin based perovskite solar cells. So let's start our discussion. My presentation today entitled Solvents for Processing Stable Tin Halide Perovskites. Perovskite solar cells have emerged in the last few years. And now it's considered as one of the most promising BV technologies. Device efficiencies jumped from around 3% in 2009 to over 25% now. This considered a huge jump in a limited time scale, but the highest performing cells are based on lead. Lead is a toxic heavy metal and any leakage to the environment will be considered very harmful. And this toxicity is a big obstacle in the way of perovskite solar cells commercialization. In this slide, we can see a proof of lead toxicity. On the left hand side, we have a plants that were planted in a natural soil, while on the right hand side, we have the same plants are planted in perovskite contaminated soil. The effect on the plant is very obvious. They found some lead atoms in the leaves of the plant. So the current situation between lead halide perovskites and tin halide perovskites is not in the favor of tin halide perovskites. For now, the problem with lead is a toxicity while tin is eco-friendly. So why tin perovskites are far behind lead counterpart? First of all, tin plus 2 is easily oxidized to tin plus 4 because tin is not stable in the plus 2 oxidation state. So it starts with an oxidation initiator which could be very few oxygen atoms in, in the glove box or could be some tin plus 4 contamination in the preparation materials itself. And what happens that tin plus 2 oxidized to tin plus 4, this leads to a self-doping in the cell which means the absorber material is full of holes or positively charged tin atoms. Inside the absorber, we have a huge amount of holes versus few amounts of electrons. So the probability of any photogenerated electron to meet a hole is very high. So what happens is the lifetime of the photocarriers is very short because once they are generated, they locate a hole and then they relax again as a non-radiative recombination. This leads to very, very low quasi-Fermi level splitting, which means very, very low open circuit voltage. The efficiency of thin halide perovskites is low due to the, the voltage component is very low, while the current is relatively high, and in most cases better than uh, lead halide perovskites. What is the origin of thin oxidation in thin halide perovskites? From the starting point, it could be from the materials itself. So the tin iodide material itself could be contaminated with tin plus four or could be from the solvents. So we did some investigations for materials and we became sure that tin iodide that we use from alpha ether, I think, is very pure and it does not contain any tin plus four. So we shifted to the solvents. Fortunately, we found that DMSO could initiate an oxidation mechanism inside the precursor solution itself. And this was published in the same time from our group and um, another group in Canada, where the two publications reported the same mechanism, which ends up by forming the hydrogen sulfide with its, um, with, with its characteristic odor. So an oxidation mechanism could happen due to due to DMSO inside the precursor solution itself. So what is the solution to this situation? Is to find a new solvent. So now we, it's clear that DMSO oxidizes thin halide perovskites and the new solvent should be found. So how could we select a new solvent for thin halide perovskite? First of all, what is the solvent definition? We defined it as a solvent that could form a stable formamidinium thin iodide as the basic uh, tin halide composition solution at concentration above one molar at room temperature. So the criteria were, first of all, this solvent should be liquid at room temperature, non-hazardous, so we could process it safely inside the glove boxes or inside the processing environment. Third, uh, available commercially, and fourth, we excluded some families of the chemical compounds like strong acids or big aromatics that are used as uh, anti-solvents commonly and so on. So we did a solvation protocol where we started from a new solvent, 
Then in first step, we try to dissolve a certain concentration of thin iodide, which is relatively high concentration, maybe two or three molar. If it dissolves thin iodide, then we go to dissolve uh, formamidinium iodide or we add the corresponding amount of formamidinium iodide according to our calculator. And finally, now we have the formamidinium thin iodide precursor solution. If the thin iodide didn't dissolve at all, we go to the second side of our protocol where we start first with the formamidinium iodide. If it dissolves, we go for the thin iodide and then finally we have the same precursor solution. We have scanned around 2,000 molecules and then we choose of them 80 uh, of them to test. So 80 solvents were uh, actually tested in the lab and 16 of them already work and dissolved uh, formamidinium iodide or form the precursor solution of formamidinium iodide. So then we could group these 16 working solvents into six main groups. What are the properties in the molecules that allow them to solubilize the formamidinium iodide and thin iodide? There are many ways to do this, but in this regard, I will explain one method depending on the dielectric constant and the donor number. So what we did here, we plotted the dielectric constant of our um, uh, solvents versus the solubility if it is uh, soluble we give it one if not we give it the value of zero and also on number b we have the donor number versus the solubility and we could notice that there is a threshold to form a solvent for perviscite the threshold of dielectric constant was around 17 so all the molecules dissolved perviscite has uh, a dielectric constant from 17 and above the same behavior for donor number which was 14.7 kilocalorie per mole and then if we plotted the dielectric constant versus the donor number we can define a region where we find the solvents of uh, perviscites so the easiest way to know if these precursor solutions could form a perviscite uh, or not we did the drop casting of a certain amount of the precursor on a glass substrate and uh, we opted for a thermal uh, ramp of about 12 degrees slices per minute between 30 and 150 degrees after which the temperature was held uh, constant at 150 degrees and the full experiment lasted for 20 minutes for the precursor solutions formed perviscite except two precursors from two solvents the two methoxythanolamine and the tri methyl uh, phosphate number one and number 10 in the picture after that we did xrd to make sure that the formed material is perviscite and it has the phases of the perviscite materials especially for medium thin iodide so as as shown here the main phases of uh, the form of medium thin iodide are represented of course there is very uh, small differences from a solution to another but this could be subjected to a deeper um, to a deeper study later. Thermal stability was done by uh, heating the precursor solution for three hours at 100 degrees Celsius and the color change was observed. So in this case, if there is any color change, this could lead to instability and decomposition of, of the complexations or changes in the compleximetry of the precursor solution. So most of the solvents as shown here are stable at uh, 100 degrees for three hours. We tried also to make films out of these solvents and most of them didn't form uh, well-connected uh, grains and uh, thick perviscite films. Some of them form transparent like DMAC until we get the DEF DMPU mixture. As we can see on the right hand side, this is uh, pronounced a very uh, interesting layers that are uh, really consistent and connected together and it's uh, thick enough to form uh, a perviscite solar cell. Here we show that the, the performance of the first uh, device based on our uh, new solvent mixture, DEF, DMPU. So the film looks very nice. The morphology uh, is excellent with uh, interconnected domains, no open holes, as we see usually in 10 halide perviscites. Uh, as we can see here in the table, we reach to our conversion efficiency of 62.2%. This seems not very high, but we have to notice that this is without any kind of additives, no tin fluoride, no passivating chemicals, no additives at all, just a virgin uh, form of medium tin iodide in a DFD MPU mixture. If we try to make tin halide perviscite in DMSO 
under the same conditions without addition of tin fluoride of course we will get no more than 3.8 percent thanks for watching and uh, all the questions and the suggestions are highly welcomed